where we got to, I think. Did everybody get their exam back? Yeah, I got about mine. Okay. Yeah, they were good, so well done. Um, all right, so we're going to carry on from here. Today we're going to look at sliding filament theory, which again you may have covered, if it's, especially if you actually took AMP with Dr. Barlow, I'm sure he would have covered it. Um, and um, also look at proprioception. And I have a little animation clip for you um, on the sliding filament theory, because I think that once we go through the, the bulleted list of the diagrams, it's it's difficult to visualize, and I think that animation really helps with that, hopefully. Okay? So, remember that what we're looking at here is a stained slide of a cross-section piece of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, and that each, I mean, I'm going to say round, we know they're not round, but right, each shape is a separate muscle fiber and so when you look at staining you can see that we've got different types of fibers within one muscle all right and just as a as a reminder let's go through these fiber types All right, so we have our type one, used to be called slow, okay? And they are the most oxidative. So the type one fibers are most able to use system three oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP for muscle contraction. Right? Then we have two A's and they're kind of faster but not the fastest. All right? And they can use, do some oxidative Mostly glycolytic, glycolytic. All right. And then we have type two X, fastest, and they are glycolytic. And uh, AP, AP, ATP, ATP, PC. Okay. So remember that we discussed the fact that genetically we can't change these fiber types. The ratio that we have when we're born is pretty much what we get. All right. When we train quite hard, what can happen is that we can get some type 2 A's that will act a bit more like a type 1, or they'll act a bit more like a type 2 X, right? So we can persuade the muscle fibers to act a little bit more like something we want to use, but we can't actually change them from one to the other. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so sliding filament theory uh, has been
been around for a long time. It's, it's the contraction theory that I learned um, in ooh, A level and then again in undergrad. Um, it's the best able to explain how the muscle proteins interact with each other. And remember that by shortening the muscle, we generate a lot of force there. Um, it's changed a little bit since I was first in school. Not really changed very much more that we have more information about it than we did back then. Way, way back then. Okay? So, we're going to see that thin filament, the actin, and the thick filament, the myosin, slide past each other when we look at this theory. And remember that picture at the beginning um, where we had the picture of the sarcomere and you could see very clearly that the actin is attached at one end to the Z-line. So as they slide across, it pulls the Z-lines with it and that's what shortens the sarcomere and shortens the muscle. All right. How much force we see depends on how many of those cross bridges we can form, right? Where we said that myosin head can attach to the receptor site on the actin. How many of those do we see? The number of those actin myosin complexes dictates the amount of force that can be generated at that time. All right, so let's have a look at the details. If I'm going too fast, I'm assuming that probably most of you have at least seen this idea before. Um, so if I'm going too fast, please give me a yell and I can slow down or repeat something. All right. So when the muscle is at rest, okay, the receptor site, the binding site on the actin is covered over by tropomyosin. And so that myosin head that we saw can't attach to it. So the muscles just, the proteins are just lying there, right? There's nothing going on. So step one is that we have to get a signal from the central nervous system that tells the muscle to contract, all right? So that signal is electricity and when we will finish chapter four on Wednesday and then we will start the nervous system on Friday and we'll look at the neuromuscular junction and the electrical impulse in more detail, all right? So that electrical signal can spread across the surface of the muscle and it goes down into the T-tubule, right? Sarcoplasmic reticulum, and we've got the next slide I think is a bit easier because it puts all this into pictures for us. So it depends whether you're a word person or a picture person. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the, the substance in the muscle that's kind of like the netting that's wrapped around inside the fiber, and it stores calcium ions. Right, so when the signal from the central nervous system reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it releases calcium ions into the muscle cell. And those calcium ions then bind to the troponin molecule. So remember that we said the actin protein is actually a combination of three molecules, actin, troponin, and tropomyosin. Okay. So the calcium binds to the troponin and that causes a reaction that um, instigates a sort of shift in the formation of that helix and the tropomyosin as it shifts uncovers the receptor site, the active site. All right. Then the myosin head can attach to the active site and it can do that flicking action. Remember, it's got that kind of joint between the head and the tail, 
right? So it can flick, and because it's attached to the actin, it drags the actin with it as it flicks, and that produces force. So let's look at that again in the pictures. I don't know about you, but I find the pictures easier. Not everybody does, but... Okay, and this is an absolutely super diagram that is in your book. So um, it's well worth spending some time looking at this. So here we have, this is the motor nerve. Right? And the motor nerve is synapsing with the muscle tissue. Right? And it's sending a signal from the central nervous system onto the muscle. Right? Signal can travel along the sarcolemma, along the surface, and then it falls down the T tubule. So if you look at this diagram up in the top right hand corner, you can see that there are these little holes on the surface of the muscle. Those are all T-tubules. Right? And the T-tubule allows for the electrical signal to move inside the muscle fiber. Okay? And it so happens that it runs very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So over here, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is this blue netting here, right? And this stores the calcium, right? So when it's stimulated by the signal, it will release the calcium into the um, sarcoplasm, and then the calcium can attach onto the actin protein. Okay, onto the troponin. That causes a shift which opens up the active site and allows the myosin head to attach to the active site. Myosin head flicks and drags the actin with it. These are also from your book. Um, this one is a more detailed close-up of the one on the left of what's going on here in this diagram. All right. So here's the myosin head. There's no calcium attached yet, so that site is covered over by the green and yellow ropey molecule. And in, then we get calcium attaches and it all wiggles around a little bit. And now the myosin head can attach to the site. And then we see the myosin head flip to the right and so it drags the actin to the right with it. Questions up to that point. Everyone okay? The second diagram here shows us why we need ATP, right? We've spent all this time at the beginning of the semester talking about how we make ATP for muscle contraction, right? This diagram shows why we need the ATP. Where is it in this particular bit of the muscle contraction, right, that we need the ATP? So I'm actually going to start at the last diagram because um, otherwise it doesn't make sense to me here. So ATP has to attach to the myosin head in order for the myosin head to release and cycle back to get ready to attach to another receptor site. All right? 
because it wouldn't be much good to us if we could only move that actin that much, right? If the movement involved this much, okay? So as long as that electrical signal is coming in, then the myosin heads keep cycling around and pull in the actin tighter and tighter and tighter. Okay. So the ATP is needed here to break that cross bridge and the head can recycle back here because the ATP is broken down. Remember we said that the head of the myosin was made of ATPAs, right? So that ATPase facilitates breaking down that ATP molecule and moving the head back to upright so it can attach to another um, active site on the actin. Okay. Then calcium is attached, we get another connection, the head flicks, and as it flicks, the inorganic phosphate is released and the ADP is left behind on its own. Here's the ADP. Then the ADP gets released and there's room for the ATP to attach. I think the animation does this much better personally. So this cycling of the myosin head and the pulling of the actin, right, just keeps going until the impulse down the motor nerve stops, right? When that impulse stops, the calcium ions get moved, pumped back, actively pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? The troponin, as soon as the calcium comes off the troponin, then we see a shift, a wiggle in that actin protein, and the tropomyosin covers the, the receptor site again. Right? So until that calcium is re-released, we can't see any muscle contraction. And remember, I mentioned, I'm pretty sure I mentioned Friday, that once the muscle has been contracted, that we don't have a physiological way of lengthening the muscle back out, right? We only have this mechanism to contract the muscle, all right? So we rely on external forces to take the arm back out. Right, so that's going to be contraction of the triceps, the other side of the joint, and or some, in some movements it's just the action of gravity pulling. Once that contraction is turned off, gravity pulls the arm back down.
Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the Z-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding, add more contraction, or remain unattached to allow the muscle to relax. Muscle contractions are controlled by the actions of calcium. The thin actin filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, Tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross-bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. Which will the electrical out. impulse Thanks travels down the T tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. particular piece of film is um, I think on the note page for that page we have a look yes so if you look at this um, PowerPoint and you look at the notes underneath this slide that link for that particular piece of film is there um, you can go to YouTube and type in sliding filament theory and get all kinds of 
videos and animations. Um, I like that one because it keeps it relatively simple. Some of them get really complicated um, because as usual it's, it's even more complicated than it appears here. So um, yeah, have a look around if that one was too easy for you. If you want something that's got a bit more detail on it, there's, there's plenty of them available. Okay. But I would play it a couple of times. I think that it's a really good visual of how this works. Um, one of the tricky things with XFIS is, you know, we don't have the laboratory equipment to look at this for ourselves. And, and you've got to imagine this is happening thousands and thousands of times just to walk across the room. So, um, for some people it's easier to keep it as simple as possible and just learn the theory. For other people, thinking about how this is working while I'm moving helps me to understand what's going on as I'm moving, right? And why our energy systems are so important. Take the approach that helps you the most. All right. Questions about sliding filament theory? Or anything on the animation or anything at all? So we're just going to look very briefly at the idea of proprioception here to see how um, the sensory organs that are located within muscles help the brain to learn motor skills and refine motor skills. All right. So the term proprioception is just um, regarding how does the body sense where it is in space. We have many, many sensory organs. Um, and so the brain is getting bombarded constantly with information and feedback after it's done something, all right? So even when we're asleep, it's getting um, information about um, you know how much stretch there is in the in the muscles, in the thoracic muscles that move the chest for breathing. Right? If it wasn't able to monitor that, then it wouldn't know when you weren't breathing. Right? Which actually often people do know, right? Because the brain will wake you up. So there's a name for it, and I can't think what it's called. My sister has it. Um, but sometimes when she's asleep, she'll just suddenly sit up and it's because she stopped breathing. What is that called? What is that called? Duh. No, Duh. it's gone. Doing what? Sorry. <laughs> when, you, when you stop breathing when you're asleep and your brain wakes you up. Oh. There's a name for that? Anyway, all right. So. When we're looking at the sensory organs that are linked with the muscles, right, then the information that the brain is receiving is to do with uh, how, how long the muscle is or how much it has shortened, how much force or contraction has occurred within that muscle. All right? And then the brain can include that information with the information about the motor pattern and the outcome of the motor pattern and it can 
do some adjustments, right? Otherwise, there's no way of learning, okay? So, um, that information reaches the brain consciously and subconsciously, all right? So, the learning effect then, when we're looking at a motor skill, right, we, we practice and practice and practice, and the reason we practice is because we want to be able to reproduce a specific motor pattern at a specific time, right? Otherwise, why would I practice? I could just go out and see what happens. But we don't want to go out and see what happens. We want to go out and do the skill we want, right? So in order to repeat a specific motor pattern, the brain has to learn which muscle fibers to turn on, when to turn them on, how many of them to turn on, because that relates to force, and when to turn them off. Right? It's a huge, 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 huge learning curve for the brain. That's why motor skills are so difficult for people to learn. Right? Maybe not for you guys because you're super talented, but for most of us, motor skills are hard to learn. Right? But those of you that are athletes, at Eastern, you're super talented athletes. So <laughs> you're way above the norm for everybody else, okay? So learning to repeat that specific pattern of turn on, how many to turn on, turning them off, creates a skilled movement. Right? So think back to 212, the difference between what does a beginner look like and what does a um, experienced person look like at that skill. Okay. So when we're looking at muscles, we have two sensory organs that we want to be able to understand um, at least nominally, minimally. All right, the first is muscle spindles. So muscle spindles um, are located in parallel with the muscle fibers in the muscle, okay? And their job, and they're attached at either end within the muscle. So when I stretch the muscle, I also stretch the muscle spindle. And then the muscle spindle sends that information to the central nervous system, and the central nervous system can learn what's going on. And this information is getting sent all the time. Right? So one of the things that happens if we stretch the muscle very, very quickly and a large amount of information gets sent from the muscle spindle very quickly to the spinal cord is that we get a reflex action back from the spinal cord to the muscle tissue telling it to contract. Right? So it's like a safety mechanism. All right? So if I step on a rock and I roll my ankle, I don't always break my ankle because more often than not, stretching the muscles on the outside of the ankle initiates a contraction that pulls my ankle back in line before it breaks. Right? So we're looking at the change in the length. That's the information, the stretch or the change in length, right? So we have these interfusal fibers that make up the spindle. They look just like mini muscle fibers, right? And we mentioned already that the connective tissue within the muscle acts like a rubber band if we stretch the muscle 
and then contract it, we get this additional force production of the rubber band of the connective tissue. We also get a stretch reflex initiated in the skeletal muscle. All right? So if I stretch the muscle very quickly, then I get a contraction. If I can time that right, that contraction adds to my voluntary contraction, because it goes through a reflex. So remember, reflexes are involuntary. So we have an involuntary force production that we can add to our voluntary force production and see greater force in that skill. Right? We use that all the time in sports, whether we understand it or not. Right? If you watch a gymnast on the bars, right? when they come down through the bottom of the bar, they'll drop their feet a little bit behind their hips. That stretches the hip flexor. And then when they kick, they've got more force to kick up and go over the top of the bar. Right? When we look at baseball, right? and we look at a picture, we go, a really good picture has a big stretch on this muscle. Is that right, Ryan? Big stretch here, right? Because that stretch, if you think how fast that action occurs, right? That stretch here adds force to the throw. Right? So we see greater force production when we can time a pre-stretch within the skill action. But that's highly sophisticated mechanics, right? That is not something you worry about with a beginner. That's something that you worry about with someone who's good, right? Are they timing that stretch just right? So the, there's a training effect here then, right? The adjustment of the length of the spindle, right? increases the sensitivity of the spindle to the stretch. So that's one of the training effects we see is that the spindle changes in length a little bit and becomes more sensitive. That's really crucial to very complex movement skills. The second sensory organ we want to pay attention to is the GTO, or the Golgi tendon organ. And the GTO is located at the coalescence of the connective tissue and the muscle into the tendon itself. So it's at that musculotendon junction. Okay? And the job of the GTO also involves a safety aspect because it's going to monitor how much force, how much tension is being created within that muscle. And it will send that information to the central nervous system. And then if necessary, the spinal cord will send back a signal to the muscle to relax. Too much tension, too much force, you're going to break something. Right? So, most of the time, it's going to protect the tendon from rupturing, or it's going to protect the skeleton from breaking. Right? I say most of the time because I have two ruptured Achilles, so it obviously didn't work in my case. Right? But most of the time, it's going to protect the tendon and the skeleton from breaking from the amount of force production in the muscle. Okay. On an aside, it's one of the um, bad effects of taking steroids and things, right? Because the muscle can produce so much force that it breaks the skeleton. It happens, right? So, 
There are training techniques that utilize the idea of the GTO to try to decrease the inhibition from the GTO. So the training technique is trying to turn down the response of the Golgi tendon organ to the force being produced. Because just imagine what would happen if you were doing a 1RM, right? And a 1RM is the most amount of weight you can lift at that point in time, right? So you have to be able to produce the most amount of force you can produce at that time to do a 1RM, right? So I'm doing a bench and I'm halfway through my 1RM and my Golgi tendon organs send all this information and my spinal cord tells my muscles to relax. That, that would be bad. You would have to hope you had a really good spotter or two, right, to save your face, okay? So part of what we're doing when we're training and we don't go into the gym and immediately do a 1RM is trying to train the Golgi tendon organ to respond to inappropriate force rather than appropriately timed force. Okay. So when we look at this idea of a signal from the muscle spindle to the spinal column, and then that signal can either wrap around a reflex and it will also travel up the spinal column to the brain so the brain can learn from that piece of information, right? And then we've got a similar idea with a Golgi tendon organ sends information to the spinal column and then information comes back to change the contraction of the muscle tissue, right? There's it doesn't take too much of a stretch of your imagination to understand that there are plenty of areas within that picture where fatigue could be an issue, right? So fatigue within the muscle tissue, fatigue within the, the neural tissue sending the signal, fatigue within the loop within the spinal column, right? So we've got plenty of sites within this reflex action that can be affected by fatigue, which then can lead to injury. All right. So training these pathways, right, part of what we're doing when we're practicing is training these neural muscular pathways so that they're more resistant to fatigue. And then teaching the brain this optimal timing pattern so we've got this amazing elite performance. Right. So this diagram is a bit simple, um, but I like it because it just sort of pulls both of the sensory organs into, into one picture here. So here's my muscle spindle, bless you. Here's the sensory nerve, the afferent nerve. So when I stretch this muscle spindle, it's gonna send a signal along the afferent nerve to the spinal column. And then it synapses to the alpha motor neuron and we get a signal back to the muscle tissue to contract the muscle, right? They haven't drawn the um, reflex loop in here, but we have a similar picture from the Golgi tendon organ. Since we have too much force or too much tension for some reason in the muscle, it's gonna send a signal to the spinal column and a signal is going to come back reflexively to the muscle tissue to relax somewhat and release some of that force. Right. So if you can follow this idea, 
right? And think about sliding filament theory. So we're turning on and off that calcium coming out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the reticular, reticulum into the um, sarcoplasm, right? So all of this is happening at, together. So you want to try to build the picture so that you get the, the whole picture here, right? Okay, well, I have office hours this afternoon, so once this is filtered through in your brain, if you suddenly think, I need her to tell me that again, jump on into office hours and I'll be there. Okay? Bye!